Hello, everyone, and, and welcome to our, our final symposium of the year on uh, ecological dynamics. Um, it's been fantastic seeing friends from near and far um, participating in these events, and uh, we hope that you'll continue to join us uh, next year. Um, of course, we're optimistically expecting to be in person next year, so if you're in the New York area, we'd, we'd love to have you uh, come join us. Uh, we'll feed you lunch. Um, and we're also hoping to, to stream the events uh, on Zoom or a similar format, so, so keep an eye out for that uh, if you're not local. Um, for those of you that are, that are new here, um, we give each, each speaker a luxurious 90 minutes uh, while asking them to only bring material for a standard length talk. Uh, the idea is that your, your questions will lead to more extended discussion than can be typically afforded. Um, of course, translating lively discussion to an online format is challenging. And we've experimented with a few different formats. Um, so, so today, you should feel free to, to unmute yourself and ask your question to the speaker directly. And if you prefer not to do that, you can type your question in the chat. And I'll keep an eye out and, and raise some of them. Or perhaps someone else um, on the call will, will, will know the answer um, and respond. Um, and I, I, I hope that the speakers also will, will pause periodically for, for discussion. Uh, so with that, let's, let's get right to the science. Uh, we have an amazing lineup of, of speakers for you today, um, all in different time zones. Um, and our first speaker is Guy Boonin from the Technion, uh, who will tell us about high dimensionality and the dynamics uh, and structure of ecolog ecological communities. So Guy, uh, welcome, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, David, for uh, inviting me. Uh, thank you all for coming. I absolutely endorse uh, David's suggestion in terms of, you know, please ask questions whenever you like. I will try to pause um, um, and, you know, try to force you to ask questions. Uh, you know, in this format, sitting in front of a screen, it's really, you know, it's nice to have someone talk to you at some point um, since you don't even see the, the people. All right, so let's get started. So one thing that um, I mean is, is is common to so much of, of what we uh, what people in, in ecology are interested in is this incredible richness of ecosystems around us, nature. It's not just many different species, as you all know. It's also the chemicals exchange, survival strategies, species associating and interacting in many different ways. Um, and that is something that I find is also it's also an important emotional point for ecologists. They tell you how, you know, I was seven and I looked down into a pond and uh, then I knew I'm going to be an ecologist with all the things I saw in there. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a big deal in ecology. So the thing is that um, actually when you look at what people are doing, let's say theoretically, what frameworks they're using, uh, to describe systems, often it's, um, well, maybe still rich, but in, in a sense, it's, it's simpler theories than, than what, you might, uh, what you might expect for such, a, for such systems. And let me give a few examples. One of them is a neutral theory, um, basically says, okay, there are 700 species of flowering plants in, in some uh, rainforest, but maybe it's all just, in a sense, one flower in terms of how it uh, you know, acts and, and whatever it does, um, a related, um, and then you, the flowers might have different colors, but, but it's just a bad passive thing. And, 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 and really, if you're colorblind, you see just one flower. Um, a related question, can a, a network of different species can be simplified to just a few species? If you have uh, many flowers, maybe you can treat them as just one flower, and then all the parasites is just one parasite. Uh, functional groups uh, can be grouped together and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, another uh, family or, or, or type of simplification is that of what I call here a single axis. Um, it's, you know, many examples exist. There's a, a niche axis, for example, there's, a, I don't know, birds living at the different height uh, on the tree to give a classic example, different trade-offs um, and so on and so forth. Um, another type of, of, of uh, possible simplification, which might or might not be true, uh, comes uh, in, 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 in dynamics. So for example, if you have uh, fluctuations of some, the abundance of some species, 
Um, and you measure it over time, you can ask, well, maybe they're just fluctuating because the external conditions are changing in time, temperature, uh, you know, pH, whatever it is. Um, another possibility is that, yes, there are endogenous fluctuations in the system, but maybe they're due to just two, three key species doing something, some low dimensional chaos, and the rest are just um, passively fluctuating due to the effect of these uh, key species. And the, um, the goal of what I'm going to talk about in this talk is how to identify and understand cases that do not belong to one of these examples, where all these simplifications, what, what I'm going to call low dimensional simplifications, do not work. And um, instead, you ask yourself, well, um, you know, what is it that would be there instead? And we know um, um, in other fields, uh, physics uh, and, and fields of, around biology, neural networks, uh, and flocking, and so on, that there are emergent many variable phenomena, what in physics you call many body uh, physics. And somehow in ecology, it seems to me in community ecology specifically, which is what we'll be talking about, it seems to me that um, for some reason it's been harder to, to see, it's less obvious. Anytime you see water, uh, ice melt, then you're seeing something like, a, you see the phase transition, that's a, a, you know, an emergent many variable phenomena. Why, why are we not seeing it uh, so easily in ecology? Um, okay, so, so, so that's the general question. Um, I want to ask, and I want to say one more thing, and that is that this issue has practical implications in, um, you know, even beyond academic interest and in mainstream, uh, you know, both academic and practical ecology. Uh, if, again, if we have some complex network, if we have a fishery, for example, that's a practical example. Um, well, what people do essentially is, is either they do, usually either they do complex simulations with very many variables, uh, which you know, are hard to measure, let alone uh, know what model to use, or they use um, insight from traditional theories, many of which have you know, just a few species. And there, this is very, these the theories are actually very insightful, but uh, the connection, any systematic connection with, with dozens or more species is, uh, is hard to make uh, in many cases. Okay, and the question is, you know, what else can we do? Okay, so this talk will be, uh, I'll have two, uh, two parts. Both of them are these attempts to, to look for what might be uh, something uh, which I'll call high dimensional. One of them, well, the first one will be what I call the high road of statistical mechanics, looking for relevant variables, the temperature, pressure, and, and, and density of, of, of some system, you know, um, looking at what observables we can, we can look at and, and looking at phase transitions, phases and phase transitions. And the other one uh, will be uh, more, um, you know, it will be a bit different. It will be more with questions that are more familiar to ecologists, uh, basically, the question is how do many, many species uh, coexist, what that means for the structure of the interactions between them. And in this, in the, the first one, I won't show any data uh, today. For the second part, I will show um, detailed um, uh, comparisons of the theory with uh, plant competition experiments. Okay, so let's get started. So the one slide, I mean, you all know these things, I, I, I'm guessing, but let's just uh, say one slide about community, what community ecology is. It's communities of different species and they coexist and they uh, interact and so on. You know, it involves, it includes anything from viruses uh, to pol polar bears. So of course, uh, there's huge variation in, in you know, what, what, uh, what an ecological community can be. Um, but uh, while, you know, of course, these systems vary significantly, they have some processes in common, you know, organisms move, or if not, at least, you know, the seeds of a tree uh, disperse, interactions between organisms, 
And there's also in the background always evolution. I'm not going to talk about that today, uh, not in this talk. And you all know, uh, you know, standard interactions between species. You have classic examples such as competition over resources, predator-prey uh, interactions, you know, mutualism, and so on. Okay, that's uh, I think that's it for the uh, basic introduction. Any questions so far? Okay, I'm. Uh, this is uh, this is indeed very standard. Okay, so I want to focus mostly. I'll when I when I um, you know deviate from the, the main um, setting and the main model. I'll tell you, but I want to focus mostly on one of the simplest um, one of the simplest models or frameworks for um, for dealing with all these uh, questions uh, in dynamics and community ecology. And that is um, uh, a setting where you have a local community, say some, some location, and um, there's a, a few plants there. And these plants come from some species pool, regional species pool, which has more, potentially more species. And you know, they migrate into this or disperse into this local community. And um, you know, they fight it out, and some live and some don't in that uh, local community. Um, this process is known as assembly. And um, yeah, and, and we will be looking at this process of assembly throughout the uh, discussion, this talk today. All right, so I want to be very uh, concrete. And again, I'll give one um, very specific model I'll be you know, discussing all along and I'll point out to other kinds of models uh, maybe uh, throughout, but again, I want to have something uh, concrete in mind. So uh, the dynamics are the well-known lot Volterra uh, described, but we're assuming they're described by the well-known lot Volterra model in which uh, if you have just one species, basically all it does is it's a logistic, uh, it's exponential growth with logistic saturation, which you all know. Um, it reaches the number which we know as the carrying capacity and I'll be working with the relative abundance. Namely, I'll uh, divide the abundance uh, the, which is the number of, of, of the individuals of the species uh, in, in the community by the carrying capacity. So it's normalized to something where if it's alone, it would reach uh, n equal to capital n equal to one. And then for two species, um, you know, we just add these bilinear interactions here. So uh, we have two additional um, uh, two additional parameters, alpha one, two, the effect of two on one, and alpha two, one, the effect of one on two. And again, uh, you know, just by setting the signs of these numbers, you can have anything from, you know, competition over resource credit or prey and mutualism. Uh, note that in this uh, setting, um, the positive alphas are um, the competition or predation that we, with this sign convention. All right. And for many, many species, uh, you can do the same thing. You have a bunch of uh, coupled ordinary differential equations, one for each species. And uh, what I'm adding here uh, at the end is an additional term, which is migration from an external source, um, which is the regional species pool we discussed before. So that's where the species migrate from. And the one thing I want to note here is that there is uh, a lot of freedom in choosing the parameters. Okay, this, uh, this uh, matrix alpha in particular, if you have 50 species, you have over 2000 numbers here. Uh, I think this is a, this is a major issue um, that we have to deal with. This is not a, um, you know, this is not some Something you can you can swipe under the rug as far as I'm concerned. Um, okay, and Sakai, can I can I ask a question? Yes, yes, David. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So thank you. Um, so would there not also be fifty diffusion constants in a more realistic model? Uh, is space only going to be uh, in, uh, incorporated as this outside uh, migration? Yeah, so I am going to talk, I'm going to mention the question of space very briefly. We have, I'm very excited about spatial stuff. I just won't have time to talk about it more than a couple of slides 
that's one thing I'll be happy to discuss at some point. But again, the main thread of the talk will be with just a single community and, and just the simplest form of, of constant migration from an outside pool that is unspecified, otherwise unspecified. But, but yes, I think I can already say that um, spatial extension, like actual space, different locations of space is extremely important in these systems. Okay, I'm um, I absolutely. Can I ask a uh, question also, please? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is it in built into this model, is there, is there a concept that there's an overall carrying capacity of the, of the ecosystem? Or do you use uh, that idea that each species has some, you know, individual um, uh, uh, maximum uh, saturation value. Right. Yeah. So, so here indeed, I, I, this is, first of all, this is a phenomenological model. Um, and, and what you see here is that indeed each one of them self saturates on its own separately. Um, so even if there's no, if there are no other interactions, each of them would reach some separate, um, you know, would separately be able to go to exist there and they could all coexist perfectly. Um, and maybe that relates to the next point I wanted to make here at the bottom. Tell me if that uh, helps a bit. So one thing is that they do not reach a single, you know, there's no normalization of the entire, you know, all the abundance, although for large diverse systems, it does, does reach a self-averaging quantity. You know, it doesn't fluctuate by very much if there's many species, uh, at least after some time. Uh, but um, what I want to say is that um, there are other models and, and, and some people feel more comfortable and, and understandably with models where you have more mechanistic um, descriptions of, for example, both the resources in your system and the consumers in your system. And that too is something I'll, uh, you know, only say if, you know, have one or two slides about, again, because just because we can't talk about uh, absolutely everything in one talk, okay? But again, if this interests you, and I know in the crowd, there are people who, who are experts in, in these kinds of models, you know, I'm happy to talk about that. All right, um, so yeah, so, so, sorry, any more questions? So yeah, we were saying that one issue is that this, there are very, very many um, you know, interaction coefficients in, even in the simplest of models. And of course, if you have you know, explicit competition over resources and many other things, there are even more uh, parameters. And so we have to do something. Uh, and what you know, the, the, the route I'll be taking uh, with many other people and you know, stuff that's been done in, in other fields as well is to say, well, if we don't know all these numbers, Let's try. It. Let's just take them as uh, you know, sample them randomly from some distribution. Um, so the basic reference model, which I'm now finishing, uh, you know, this is the end of, of the definition, is um, that these numbers alpha i j in the matrix, uh, the non the uh, the off diagonal numbers are independent random variables, except possibly I would like to allow for a correlation between the effect of species I on species J and the reverse effect. Um, so that's the parameter that I'm allowing. That's a level of symmetry in this, in this um, matrix. Um, and uh, the other thing is that this matrix might have zero entries in it. It might be at some level on some level sparse, but I'm only going to talk today about the case where the number of uh, non-zero interactions uh, what I'll call the links, this number C here, the number of links is large. It's much larger than one. Okay? It can be small compared to the number of species, but it has to be large for what I'll be uh, showing today. All right, so when might something like this be relevant, this uh, random matrix um, um, description be relevant? Well, it definitely isn't relevant if you have in mind a single interaction mechanism uh, that that rules everything. That does everything. There are examples in the literature. This is on the left. You can see uh, matrix formed uh, by you know, something called the competition colonization. That's from the uh, Levins from the 1970s and others. Um, you can see that it's defined by very few parameters. It's just by I, you can see the order in it. But if there's many many things happening in many directions, then you know 
it's not just competition colonization, but also this cow that comes and steps on one on the grass as it goes to feed on some other plant, many things happening, then maybe you won't see any conspicuous order. And then maybe a uh, random matrix uh, uh, would be a you know, better starting point. Okay, so that's, that's a very um, you know, rough motivation for why we might do this. Okay, so before I uh, say anything, uh, more carefully, just if you, I want to showcase possible uh, examples of what you might see when you run this model. Okay, so you put in different parameters, it doesn't matter right now. Um, and uh, what do you see when you run the simulation? You start with all the species there, there, let's say. And what you see is starting with all the species, some might leave the community, they might you know, go down in abundance and hit the migration floor. And for some systems, different initial conditions different initial abundances can result in different final fixed points. Uh, in other cases, um, you start with different initial conditions. You always reach the same fixed point. Um, you know, you see both things. Uh, let me tell you what you're seeing here in these graphs. I'm sorry, I forgot that. So the x-axis is time and the y-axis is the abundance and each, each line here, each different, one of the different colors is a different uh, species. And so you see that here at late times, the, uh, all the species reached, uh, reached a fixed point, an equilibrium uh, state. Some of them have very low abundances, essentially migration level abundances. So they're extinct, considered extinct. The others are coexisting. Uh, and finally, at the bottom left, you can see that sometimes you never reach a, a fixed point. Uh, here, are, it's just I'm plotting three of many species. And you can see that they continue to fluctuate what looks like some erratic uh, random fluctuations um, forever and ever. Okay, so those are, are things you see, all of them in this one model. Any questions? I have, I, I, could I, I have another question. Uh, in this model, you're not uh, incorporating the discreteness of the, 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 of the species. You can't have an eighth of a fox uh, in general. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. So, so this all this continuous? Yes. Absolutely. This assumes, and I'll, I, I'll, this I will assume throughout. I will not talk about demographic noise uh, in this in this uh, talk. Everything I have here. Um, this assumes that even at the migration level, there are many species. Sorry, many individuals there. Absolutely, that is a that is a correct. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a correct comment. Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, I've got a question. This is Nigel. Yes, Nigel. Hi. Hey, Guy. Um, I've got a question. So, so as I understand it, uh, and Kenny, if I misfollowed, that the model you're using is basically similar to what Bob May was using in his famous work from many years ago. And so does the, does the model, these simulations reproduce this whole uh, complexity stability issue where we, which we... Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just checking on, I'm checking on my, uh, you know, on the clock to see how much time it took before Bob May. If, if, uh, I'm, random, if I'm randomizing you, we can defer it to, to the end. But, but I mean, I, but, but uh, no, no, that's a, that's a very good question. So, so let me say the following. Um, I'll, I'll discuss it a bit more later. So, uh, Robert May's uh, work uh, was saying the following thing: you have a general. Um, you have a general dynamical system described by, let's say, ODEs, and you linearize it. And you, he talked about the Jacobian of that uh, linearized system, and then he had uh, this relation between stability and, and, and you know, the properties of this matrix and the stability. Um, after you finished assembly here, and if you can linearize your system, then you can make the connection with Bob May's stuff. And it does make that connection in certain places. But it's important to understand that all the assembly process and this chaos and so on are inherently nonlinear uh, phenomena. And I will, uh, I will be, uh, right, I'll right, emphasize right. that in what comes later. Yeah. No, but what I want to understand is this. Um, what he found, claimed, was that complex uh, e uh, ecosystems are less stable than the simpler ones, which is which every ecologist knows is not uh, is not right. Yeah. And and so what I wanted to understand was: do do you find that uh, paradoxical or 
probably wrong, uh, complexity stability relationship in in the in the in this model description as, as well, or or, uh, or or does it recover something that is more uh, biologically relevant? I I, I will uh, I will um, let's get back to that later. I'll point out to exactly the place where I I'll say in this specific thing May was quote unquote right, in other things absolutely not, and. I think I think it's it's good not to think about it as a anyway. Let, let's when I get there, I'll I'll open it for 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 this question. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. This is an important point. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Yeah. I can already say for Nigel. I'll already say that for example, if you have space, then things are very 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 different. That's, yeah. That's already one thing. I'll again. Because both uh, David and you asked it, this thing, I'll, I'll try to say a few more words than I intend. Okay, excellent. Okay, so, um, sorry. Yeah, so, you know, in terms of a, a theoretical, you know, person doing condensed matter or statistical mechanics, uh, you know, what are we looking at here? So, a, you know, it's, it's in, in some senses, it's a bit different from, from um, you know, other systems you might have seen, um, it has these special properties, you know, species can go extinct, they go to essentially zero abundance if this migration level is very small. Um, um, and so it's a bit like a system where the number of degrees of freedom essentially changes, can change in time. Um, as again, going back to this question of space, you can have different places in space with the same or similar dynamical rules. So you have many degrees of freedom in each space, space each location in space. Um, and, and you know that's sort of an interesting uh, playground. And, and these understanding uh, you know things in, in this uh, you know can be difficult. Um, you know the simple thing if you assume that you've reached a big fixed point and you ask okay which species went extinct then of course uh, it might be hard to know. I mean if maybe species two went extinct, but then that means that species four also had to go extinct, but maybe that means that one can survive and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, these are these are difficult and interesting uh, questions to play with. Um, okay, so yeah, maybe, yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop in, in a bit later to ask for questions. So um, for this reference model, the um, we've been, Feeding this model to death for a few years now, we and, and others. Uh, there's there's a community doing this, and um, and okay, we know a bunch of things. We know properties of fixed points when they are found, uh, how many species coexist, you know, average abundance, uh, responses to fluctuations. Uh, we know that many of these things are what's called self-averaging. That means that they are set deterministically at large. You know, the fraction of surviving species uh, at a fixed point is uh, fluctuates by very little um, if you have 500 species. Um, the, we know things about the dynamics, types of dynamics, uh, extinctions, relaxation times, and so on. And the very last part, I'll be discussion, discussing this issue of interaction patterns. Um, but the important thing for now, what I want to focus on is that in every calculation we've done again and again, we find that the uh, distribution of this uh, parameter alpha ij doesn't enter. Um, there are, um, you know, you can have a Gaussian or a uniform distribution or whatever it is. Instead, what you find is that again and again at high diversity, there are three relevant parameters that enter, um, which are essentially the two first lowest moments rescaled in different ways by uh, this. Um, Number C, which I remind you is the number of that this number of non-zero links per species, which is a, we assume a large number. Um, yeah, so so that's basically it. It's uh, in words I, we call the first one the interaction, the mean interaction strength. Again, we scaled. The other one is some measure of the variability of the interactions, and the last one we've discussed before. It's the symmetry of the interactions. How much is it like uh, the interactions are symmetric or not? I. Uh, Okay, yeah, and then um, there are, uh, we've done work to, you know, uh, ecologists, uh, um, um, collaborators of mine have, have checked many, many other 
um, structures that are used in literature, different types of network structures, um, and found that many, many of them are in fact, you know, don't have much effect on the basic uh, results. This fully random, maximally random reference model does a very job, big, uh, good job in many of these cases. What you can do uh, and you must do is uh, you, if there are multiple functional groups, and by that I mean, for example, if you have a mutualism between bees and flowers and the bees help the flowers but compete between themselves, then you need to extend these basic models uh, with more parameters, um, but just a few more, right? Go from three parameters to, I don't know, nine parameters, let's say, and, and then you can, um, you can capture what happens in these groups. Um, if this was a, 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 a talk to uh, ecologists, to mainstream ecologists, I would spend, I don't know, 70% of the time on these last two points, okay? Um, I want to do other things, but I think, uh, you know, if there is one you know, zeroth order message to the mainstream ecology community, it, it will be this, that um, there is another way of dealing with these um, complex, if you want to, if you do want to simulate model these complex communities, there's another way of doing things that is not just, you know, either very complex simulations or, um, you know, this insight from few species classical uh, ecology models. Um, but again, I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of my time on that today. Okay, I, I see there's questions in the chat. David, do you, I, I don't, uh, sh sh uh, they're, they're just, I, uh, okay. Okay, good. Okay, so you're in charge of that. Okay, I'm not looking at the chat anymore. Good. All right, so let's, uh, so, so now we have a few uh, parameters that control things like the diversity, the response to fluctuations, and, and all the things we care about, and average abundance, all the things we care about in, a, in, you know, in these models. And that's very, very good. And that means that we have something like thermo, like in thermodynamics, you have temperature pressure, and, and that sets the density of the gas, something like that. So um, what we can do now is start plotting phase diagrams, okay? Start to systematically uh, go through uh, these few uh, axes we, we now have. And uh, I'm showing you, um, you know, the phase diagram that we find. This is a cross-section at a given uh, level of symmetry. I remind you there's the symmetry of the matrix, so let's assume that you fix that. And then there's the um, how the x-axis is essentially how strong the interaction is on average. The y-axis is how variable it is. Uh, this sigma, I remind you, is the standard deviation uh, rescaled uh, by the number of links. And what you find is three, uh, um, three um, phases, rather a bit more. Uh, one of them is a uh, phase where you start the dynamics and whatever happens, however you start the dynamics with whatever initial conditions, you reach a fixed point. You always reach the same fixed point. It's a single stable universal fixed point of the dynamics. Some species extinct, some species survive. There's another uh, case. If the interactions are symmetric, um, strictly symmetric, where alpha ij is equal to alpha ji, there is a phase where you reach, where there are very many fixed points. Um, this is, uh, for the experts, this is a spin glass phase. Um, very many fixed points, many of them almost marginally stable. And uh, the first thing I want to show you is that indeed, um, you know, the transition between these two um, phases is sharp, um, as you would expect from a true phase transition at high diversity. Uh, you see a unique fixed point, and then you move a bit up in this parameter sigma, and you see uh, the, the probability of having many fixed points jumps. Okay, so that's the first thing, indeed, a phase transition. Um, in a different case where the interactions are not symmetric, okay, let's say that the uh, all the numbers are sampled independently, so there's no relation. For example, there might be no relation between the effect of species I or species J and vice versa, then what you find are these uh, dynamical, persistent dynamical fluctuations um, that go on forever. 
we now know and understand that this is really chaos at a, on a very high dimension. And uh, uh, Guy, is, can, I, can I ask? Which, yeah. So, so mm -hmm. just a quick question. Um, is it meaningful to talk about uh, negative values of the mean, uh, an abundance of mutualism, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. Um, you can do that to some extent, but if you have too much of that, then um, your abundances diverge, which just means that the lotka volterra model is not a good description because you need better, you know, stronger uh, limitation, you know, some self-limitation or non-linearity, okay? Um, and indeed, in this model, I'm not showing it, there is essentially when you cross into cooperation, into very strong cooperation, you have a diverging phase. But a, but a little bit of mutualism, you still can ask these questions about fixed points and stability and so forth? Absolutely, absolutely. There is a level, it's, it's, uh, it's not within, the way I'm, I'm drawing the, the way I'm rescaling the variables in this graph, you, you can't even see it. You can go only down to, an, in a negative area here, into a mean of order one over the number of uh, species. Okay. You can't go very far, at least for many species. Okay. Um, Thanks. Right. So, yeah. So I want to, uh, because this is, uh, the, the title has the word of the, of the whole symposium today, has the word dynamics in it. I want to focus on just one phase transition, the transition from a unique fixed point into chaos in, in detail. And this is, to me, this is the simplest, most standard phase transition in the system. It's similar to things that have been discussed in the 80s uh, for neural networks, for example. It's, it's the most standard phase transition. There are more exotic things, but let's just look at just one uh, example in more detail. So, what I want to do now is to say, okay, let's um, let's look at this phase diagram and let's start on the x-axis and move up as this red arrow uh, indicates. And what you're doing is you're starting with uh, no heterogeneity in the species interactions. Okay, so they're all interacting in exactly the same strength, and then they can all survive. That's a known thing um, when the when this number is less than one. Um, okay, so you move up a bit, you start moving up, and what the first thing that happens as you increase the variability is that some species start to go extinct, okay, but you're still reaching a unique fixed point, that's what we've said so far. You continue to increase your, uh, this variability, this, va this variable sigma, uh, and what you get is this transition to chaos. Linear stability of the coexisting species is lost. Okay. Um, and you start seeing dynamical fluctuations. Um, going to Nigel's question, um, the point where this happens, if you linearize the equations and you ask, how that point is related to the interactions between the coexisting species, this is described or it can be understood as a May down, okay, the loss of linear stability. So that's the connection to May. Um, as you continue to increase this uh, variable sigma, the size of the dynamical fluctuations increases, but it increases continuously, okay? There's no jump in the size of fluctuations, okay? Um, this is a continuous phase transition in the, in the language of physics. Hell does not break loose as soon as you cross the main down. You see a bit of fluctuations, and then if you continue to go up, you see more fluctuations and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and that's the that's the scenario. And I want to point out a few things here. First of all, this scenario isn't obvious. I mean, every step here could have been different. I mean, species didn't have to. Um, didn't have to go first extinct. You know, you might lose linear stability before going extinct, before species going extinct. Um, you might never lose the linear stability. I mean, if a lot of species go extinct, you might be left with a single species and never lose linear stability. So you might never reach point number two. The size of the dynamical fluctuations didn't have to increase continuously and so on and so forth. Um, on the other hand, in many models, 
um, including consumer resource models, which I'll say a word about in a second, we see this scenario as it is shown here. And um, note again that this, all of these uh, things are inherently due to the nonlinear dynamics of these many variables. And therefore, um, you know, and you know, the good old linearizations that people uh, since may have done cannot capture these things. Okay, so at least we have some, uh, I would say a niche here, something that, that we can do um, that, that might, uh, you know, give some insight into these uh, systems. Okay, questions uh, about this? Okay, um, yeah, one last point. The note that these, this scenario gives a, a set of qualitative predictions, okay? If you run an experiment, you don't need to measure quantitatively anything uh, to see these to see these things, and this is what I like about uh, these this set of predictions. Okay, now a word about consumer resource uh, models. Um, to those, of, so this is a word for the experts on this. Um, if you don't know these uh, these models, it, it won't affect what I'll be talking about in what follows. So so don't worry about it very much. But I do feel like I want to say something about this. Um, so resource competition models or consumer resource models are models where you explicitly model the resources, uh, let's say water and the different nutrients, and also explicitly model the abundances of the species. So both the amounts of the resources and the species are explicitly modeled. Uh, there has been an extremely uh, beautiful and extremely influential model uh, by MacArthur from the late 60s. And um, in that model, you always reach uh, an equilibrium uh, fixed point. Uh, and um, there is an issue that you cannot go beyond what's known as the competitive exclusion limit, meaning that the number of coexisting species is much, it has to be equal, smaller or equal to the number of resources. Um, the point I'd like to make on all this uh, story, and there's a lot of work on different variants of this model, is that this model is, um, because of the linearity of, of the way it was chosen, is um, structurally unstable. It's, this, it's a fine-tuned model. In that model, you never see chaos, but once you change the model a bit, add nonlinearity in the intake functions and so on and so forth, add a bit of other interactions of whatever kind, you do get a, a transition into dynamical fluctuations. And in fact, you can cross the competitive exclusion. Okay, so that was, again, a parenthetical remark. Any questions, anything about this issue? This is something we can discuss later for those, you know, who, who are, you know, experts on, on, on this and, and are interested. Um, all right, so let's go on. There's, yeah, there's a, sorry, a there was question. a question. Yeah, there's a question in the, in the chat. Um, have you tried simulating systems with an allele, an allele effect term in each equation, uh, like an additional B plus NI multiplier? Right, so alley effects are interesting. <laughs> Alley effects are interesting because then species that do not um, do not, you know, which are very small abundance might not be able to invade. Okay, um, and yes, and you can do all the calculation for these things, and there's interesting things happening there. For example, just because of the fact that species cannot, in, you know, invade, you might you will have many many fixed points where you just, you know write off one of the species, you don't let it enter, and, and, and there it is, you have another fixed point. So there's, for example, there's many more fixed points. Um, yeah, there's, 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 uh, there's uh, interesting effects there as well, absolutely. Anything else? All right, so let me, uh, uh, re let me uh, summarize this part of the talk, uh, the first half. Um, so, for, uh, just let me see, yeah, okay, and then I'll make a couple of other remarks, but for this part of the talk, um, in these high dimensional dynamics, uh, in, in this particular uh, example of the transition to chaos that I focused on, we have specific 
uh, qualitative predictions for what we expect to happen as you cross this transition. Um, we have, I didn't talk about this much, but we have, you know, you can uh, differentiate between these, this uh, particular scenario and alternative explanations such as environmental fluctuations that act on the species separately. Uh, for example, here the species would, would not show strong correlation in their abundances in time and in environmental fluctuations they would and also difference from differences from low dimensional chaos and also differences from neutral theory. Okay, so all the, the different, the, the, the leading different other uh, competitive, uh, uh, competing explanations um, you know, can be uh, teased out and you can um, tell if something you're seeing is this rather than anything else. And really the big question um, right now is, can any of this be tested on, empir on empirical data um, I, I can say that we have some you know, encouraging uh, uh, results, but it's very early for me to talk about these things. Uh, I'm very happy, to, I'll be very happy to hear from anyone in the crowd about any ideas uh, on how to do these things. There's a lot of systems out there, a lot of data that I, I surely don't know all of it, and yeah, um, I'll be happy to, to, to discuss these things. All right, so that was that. One last thing before I go on, and that is a one line, uh, one, one uh, slide, sorry, on spatially expanded systems, okay? Because as David Nelson was remarking, remarked, you know, the world, the na nature out there has space in it, namely there are different locations in space and uh, the swell mixed approximation is not a good one in those, in many cases. And what happens there is that there are incredible, beautiful, different behaviors. So I'll give, so one thing is, for example, that the chaotic phase becomes, uh, can be stabilized when you have different uh, locations in space, um, because essentially what happens is that the chaos is, um, has, generates desynchronized dynamics between the different patches in space. And that allows species to coexist for extremely long times, even if there's no migration from some external deus ex machina that saves your species. Okay, even in a closed system with even, I don't know, four or eight different patches, different locations in space, you can already have um, uh, very many species. You can cross the May bound very easily here. Um, yeah, we have work on it. Uh, there's a uh, work in Daniel Fisher's group about uh, essentially the same. Um, same phenomenon. Another very different thing, there's a phase where what you have is that in different locations in space, you have different um, subsets of species that are able to form stable fixed points. And then you compete in space between these different uh, possible states. And there's um, you know, the replication, emergent replication of these emergent states in space. And then there's a Darwinian-like selection at the community level. Um, and you see these are two very different things that happened in, in the same model. All right, so um, that's that for this part. Yeah, so where do we stand? Um, with, all, with all I've told you, so first of all, okay, so I, what I told you, okay, you already know, what are the issues? Uh, this modeling approach, is not widely accepted in mainstream ecology. You know, all these random matrices, they're, they're very suspicious of these things. Um, and we've been trying to make some inroads uh, there. Uh, the other thing that I would really like to see is an experimental confirmations. Um, that would make my happiness uh, complete or much, much larger than it is now. Okay, questions so far about this? Good. Okay, so now I want to switch gears uh, a, well, a bit and talk about a different question on this uh, one in the same model. So, um, okay, so one question that, that comes up is, okay, you're saying that these interactions, you're assuming that the interactions are random. Why not just measure the interactions and ask if the matrix looks random? Can we do that? And okay, uh, beyond questions like, um, uh, beyond questions like what do you, how do you measure randomness and so on, there's one issue 
already at the, at the start, and that is that a random interaction matrix that is completely random, you know, the, 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 from the ensemble that we discussed at the beginning with, with uh, independent random numbers, this matrix of interactions, once you run the dynamics, it does not allow all the species to coexist. Um, as we've seen before, some species die. And so what you really want to see if you're looking at a given community in nature is to ask what happens to the interactions between the coexisting species, okay? And um, what does it mean for species to coexist in this model? So um, let's, well, for now on, I'm going to assume that we are, so that we reach a stable fixed point in the dynamics. And then you set this, uh, you know, this uh, change in time to zero. And then one of two things happen, either you go extinct and then this n is zero or uh, what's here in these parentheses in the lot couple terra model has to be equal to zero. So basically what this means is that for the coexisting species, okay, which it might be hard to know, but suppose you know what the coexisting species are, um, full, full coexisting requires it is necessary that this matrix equation uh, is fulfilled for the coexisting species. And of course, the hard part is that all these ends have to be positive, okay? So you have to have a matrix solution, a solution to a matrix equation in positive, uh, with all positive um, values. Okay, so then the question, which is an old question asks is, uh, question of coexisting me coexistence mechanisms, what matrices alpha would allow for this full coexistence? And there are you know, there's work in, in, in there's, there's been work on these questions. And one type of approach is to suggest a specific, what's known as mechanism. As I mentioned before, you can say, okay, uh, some species grow faster, uh, others uh, outcompete them after a long time. And so that generates some trade-off. And then you suggest a specific structure for the matrix. You can study, uh, exhaustively study uh, the space of matrices that's usually possible with a few uh, species, or you can completely ignore the issue uh, and just go on with your life. And I'm not saying that's cynically, um, you know, for many purposes, you can just forget that uh, anything, that, that this is a problem. Okay, uh, what I want to talk about today is uh, about the, the, the following approach that is in line with what we discussed so far. You start from a randomly, maximally random matrix, and you uh, look at the dynamics and you look only at the uh, surviving species and you look at only at the interaction between the surviving species and you ask about the structure of this matrix of interactions. And um, we, uh, we can calculate analytically properties of this matrix, okay? And I'm not going to talk about the analytics, but just say one word about it. Um, Usually what you ask about a system is you are given a system, let's say in physics or given the Hamiltonian, whatever, and you ask about the properties of the variables that can change, right? Okay, so, so in this case, you are given the matrix alpha and you ask about the uh, properties of these ends of, of the abundances of the species. And that's something you can do in these systems using techniques from disordered systems and so on. You can calculate different probabilities. For example, the probability that two species coexist given the interactions between them. Um, but uh, what we want to ask now is sort of the Bayesian inverse of this question. Namely, what are the properties of these alpha, of these matrix alpha, let's say the interaction between two species given that they survive, okay? So what you do in, in all these, in, in this problem is you solve things regularly and then perform a Bayesian inverse. And what that means is that this probability of uh, a matrix given the abundances is an interesting one, okay? And, um, we'll get to that in a second, but first uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you that the, indeed the matrix of a coexisting species is not a maximally random coexisting uh, uh, matrix. It has correlations along rows and columns, which means that different species, the way they affect the single species is uh, correlated. Um, and now I want to tell you 
what this matrix does look like. Okay, so so the idea is the following. As I said uh, before, where did I say? It? Sorry, uh, I, I'm missing one slide, but it doesn't matter. I, I can tell you in in, in words. So. Um, so suppose you are given a vec, you know, you're giving the abundances of all species, okay? Then um, there are many matrices alpha that can support these abundances of the species, okay? Why? Because there are only eight, of, let's say eight abundances and there's dozens of uh, numbers alpha. And so you can ask about the properties of the interaction matrix. Okay, the distribution of the interactions. And as I said, it's a bit like an inference problem. And so what you get is the, pro, the what you can uh, calculate is the uh, conditional uh, values of these interactions alpha given the vector of abundances, okay? And so <clears throat> what you find is that um, the interactions that sorry, coexistence shifts the interactions. Okay. And in words, what happens is that interactions between the more successful species, those that have a higher abundance in your um, in your community compared to when they if they li were living alone uh, in monoculture, the more successful species compete less, less between each other. Okay. There's, a, I don't know, a mafia type of thing that the strong species specialize in not competing with other strong species, whereas they, they, you know, they pour all their competition on the on the less successful species. Okay, so pairs of successful species interact less competitively. Okay, on average, is that is that uh, clear? Is there any question about this uh, this uh, statistical bias? Okay, um, and then there's uh, another uh, another change. There's a shift. There's there are correlations formed along rows and, and columns, um, which uh, mean that two successful species do not team up against the same species. All right. Um, so I want to. So what does this mean? Okay. So this was the math for 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 what you see there. What does it mean? Um, first of all, this pattern by construction guarantees coexistence. Okay, you started, you said, okay, assuming that these species have certain abundances, you know, what can you say about the interactions between them? Then, of course, you guarantee coexistence. I've told you the interpretation. This means that uh, even if you assume nothing else, it looks like there's a pattern where pairs of su successful species interact less competitively. And this is hard to see by eye. I mean, it's small shifts across something that is otherwise uh, has a lot of um, uh, heterogeneity, okay? So it's hard to say if the matrix, if you don't know to, that you should look for this, it's hard to say if uh, a matrix would allow all species, if the network would allow all species to coexist or not, okay? Um, right. And another uh, thing is that this, um, this, thing that we calculated from uh, this, this assembly process, sorry, this thing, uh, this exact uh, um, pattern can be uh, derived. If you know which species coexist, this can be derived from a maximum entropy type of, of argument, basically saying, suppose that we know that we are giving the abundances and we know that this is the equation, this linear equation that they have to satisfy, um, then if we look at this conditional that I was describing before, uh, what the distribution of the matrix alpha is given this constraint, you get exactly the same pattern, okay? So, so that's another way of, of, of seeing this from, a, from this max n type of um, uh, argument. Okay, so what, what is it that we've uh, done so far? We've said, okay, assuming that a bunch of species uh, coexist, we have a statistical ensemble that we're suggesting for what the interactions would look like. So let me show you how this, uh, what this looks like in an actual uh, experiment. So I'm going to uh, discuss um, experiments uh, from, 
family of experiments known as the plant biodiversity experiments, where basically you grow, you choose a bunch of, of plant species and you grow them in plots and you choose different um, mixtures of, of uh, different subsets of species. And I want to focus uh, on one, um, one um, experiment, and it's an experiment where uh, it's very good because there was so much, uh, there was so much, so many measurements done that you can actually get this full matrix alpha of interactions. Okay, so this experiment is the Wageningen uh, biodiversity experiment in, in the Netherlands. It looked at eight species of plants. It plotted, it, it, they planted them in over 100 plots uh, with uh, each species separately, pairs of species, four species, and eight species, all eight species in the same plot. The conditions are very close to natural conditions. For example, they don't water the plants, anything. They just let it sit there for 12 years. Uh, all eight species managed to survive together for eight years, which is very nice. So it's coexistence of eight species. And every year they measure the above ground uh, biomass just by cutting and weighing the plants. Um, the plants that were involved in this are standard things you've seen outside. And this is, for example, this is the oxide daisy that, that we all know. Okay, so it's, uh, uh, so this is it. And, and what you see is that this experiment has reached um, all plots seem to have reached equilibrium abundances. Okay, so the species do not continue to fluctuate in this case. All right, so what do we do with this experiment? The first thing we do is we try to fit a Lotka Volterra model uh, with essentially to fit this matrix alpha to the interactions uh, using the equilibrium abundances. Okay, and amazingly, for whatever reason, it fits well and the, uh, we did many statistical tests and we found that, for example, for eight species, this model that is fit only one and two species describes very well what happens when all eight species are there together. Okay, and other statistical tests. So for whatever reason, the Lotka Volterra model is a good description of, the, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, setting. Um, how you do it is, well, if you have, uh, you know, each species alone in monoculture, and you have them both growing together, then uh, you can get these interaction strengths. And uh, okay, we used also uh, more data um, for better error bars, but that is essentially it. Okay, so, so that's already a result. Okay, for whatever reason, the Lockable Terra model is a good model, and there's many things you could do with this model, perhaps. Uh, we were interested in a specific thing that I'll show you now, but, but this, is, this is already an interesting uh, empirical uh, result. Uh, any question about this part, about what the empirical, uh, you know, but anything so far about this? Okay. Um, all right. Um, so now me. I want to show you, sorry, Guide. there was a, Yes. Yes, Arthur here. Um, I'm just curious. Could you, could you tell us a little bit more about how is it that they measured the alphas? What kind of data do they have? Right. So, so what they did is they have these plots, right, and they grow each species separately. So you get after a few years, you get the carrying capacity. Okay. And just by measuring every year how much you have there, how much grass of such a kind. And then they have a, a, a system where they, uh, sorry, a plot where they put two of the species together, okay? And they measured both of them together. Um, and, and from those things, you can already get interactions. And they have four species together and, and, and that helps you reduce error bars, for example. So, um, so that's the kind of data they have and, and that's what we used, okay? And the point was that without using the eight species uh, community, we can already, um, we can predict the abundance of the eight species. Okay, I'm not showing that, but, but uh, we have that data. Uh, okay. So now I want, so, so this is the matrix. I mean, stare at it. I mean, I've stared at it a lot and I already see patterns in it, but um, I don't know. For me, it's already obvious that you see more blue here and more red, more blue at the bottom left corner and more red at the you know, other quadrants, but, but you know, um, maybe I'm just, just stared at it too much. Um, so let's take a quick look at this data. 
So um, this matrix is already ordered from the lowest abundant species to the most abundant species as they were measured in when the eight species were grown together. I remind you, this is relative abundance divided by the carrying capacities. And let's look at the two most, uh, at the interactions of the two least abundant species with the rest and the interactions of the two most abundant species with the rest of the species. And what you see here is at the, okay, sorry. And what, what you would expect is that the, I remind you that the most abundant species do not compete very much with the other abundant species, okay? And indeed that is what you see. So if you look at the x-axis here at the bottom, the x-axis is the abundance of the affected species and the y-axis is the strength of interactions. And you can see that the, um, they interact more weakly with uh, the other abundant species, okay? So this is the essential pattern that we were uh, describing before, that abundant species do not compete as strongly with themselves. They specialize on not competing with other species. They specialize on competing with the weaker species. Whereas in yellow here, the least abundant species show no bias in this sense. So they're competing just as much with everyone else, okay? Um, so, this is, so this is this pattern that, that we uh, predicted before, okay? But this is just a qualitative uh, um, you know, check. In fact, we did it quantitatively and it matches uh, the theory exactly. I mean, to within uh, the statistical expected uh, variations, essentially what you do is you take the abundances, only the abundances of the, these eight species, and you measure the slope of each species. This slope is this specialization, is how much you do not compete with other abundant species, with other species, um, with other more abundant species, I'm sorry. Um, and essentially you cannot tell um, this, uh, you know, the results from this experiment from a random matrix that you would generate um, from this distribution that we were predicting, okay? So there's a quantitative fit with theory with, with no free parameters, okay, in this data. And there are other, um, there are other ways of um, checking, you know, we, we did many checks on this matrix to see how well it fits the theory. I don't want to get into all the different ways of, of measuring it. Uh, you can find it in the paper if you like, but they all look you know, surprisingly good. So uh, yeah, so at least this experiment looks excellent. And we've looked at other experiments of the, from these plant biodiversity experiments. And to the extent that there's enough data, you also see my nice uh, agreement with uh, data. All right, um, I'm more or less at the end of my, uh, of, of what I wanted to say. Um, so let me, yeah, let me just summarize quickly and, uh, you know, open uh, for questions. Uh, so, right, so the question is, as I said, we were searching for this, what I called high dimensionality. And one thing I discussed is, this way, what you would do in statistical mechanics, look at what the variables are in these systems that uh, you care about, um, what are the, um, you know, what are the observables that are, you know, that you can, uh, that are deterministically set. Uh, we looked at these phase transitions and what qualitative, uh, qualitative um, things you can, predictions you can, you can suggest. And then I looked at this question of, Supposing a set of species, you know they coexist, what does that mean? What is the null model for what the interactions between them would be, you know, assuming nothing else? If there are also trophic levels, then you, know, you assume additional structure, but assuming no additional structure, what you would find is still there would be some pattern underlying everything, which I mentioned this, um, you know, this successful species competing less with each other. And I showed you how this is borne out and validated in plant competition experiments. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you.